Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Si Shang, a tobacco control researcher at Ohio State University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, Michael Pesco from the Georgia State University, and Justin White at the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read a lot. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tops, top, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from Temple, to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Frank Leone will lead a Ground Rounds presentation entitled Tobacco Dependence Treatment in Behavioral Health. Dr. Leone received his medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and completed his postgraduate training in both general internal medicine and pulmonary critical care medicine at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. He also received his master's degree in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Leone directs Penn's comprehensive smoking treatment program, a clinical program of the Penn Lung Center located at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center, the Perlman Center for Advanced Medicine, and Penn Medicine Cherry Hill. The program provides state-of-the-art and individualized treatment to smokers, including those with comorbidities. Dr. Leone's scholarship focuses on investigating advanced treatment strategies for tobacco use disorder and on testing strategies for improving the uh, care of the treatment-dependent uh, patient. Dr. Leone is a member of several professional and scientific societies, including the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, the American College of Chest Physicians, and the American Thoracic Society. He has served on the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, as has served the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as a legislative appointee to the Governor's Tobacco Use Prevention and Cessation Advisory Committee since 2001. Dr. Leone has been invited to speak at numerous lectures on topics of tobacco, of smoking treatment, and pulmonary medicine, and has published in a variety of clinical and research journals. He is a board cer certified in pulmonary and critical care medicine. Our discussant today is Si Sheng. Dr. Leone will be presenting his research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for the questions. Dr. Leone, thank you for presenting for us today. My goodness, thank you. It's really an honor to be here with you guys. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to this. This is a topic that's uh, dear to me and uh, has immediate relevance to uh, some of the most vulnerable members of our community. Uh, so I'm happy to share. Um, so yeah, my name is Frank. I'm a pulmonologist, but I do spend all my time thinking about tobacco dependence, maybe uh, from the perspective of how nicotine affects the brain, how changes in the brain change behavior, uh, how those behavior changes manifest in the clinic, and how we might be better at uh, managing this problem in the long run, both uh, through counseling and behavioral mechanisms, but also through pharmacologic interventions. I have no um, financial relationships with any commercial entity. I do receive quite a bit of grant funding from various um, federal, state, and regional uh, funding agencies to help support the research that we do and help um, extend our um, sort of uh, penetration into the community to sort of actually get this problem under better control. Um, for today, I was thinking that we might try and discuss the rationale for integrating tobacco dependence into behavioral health, um, including the, the uh, field of addiction medicine uh, we might try and review some findings of, um, of the most recent pharmacologic treatment guideline that was published by the American Thoracic Society and really begin to develop a framework for implementation in the face of clinical uncertainty or resistance. And 
Um, that uncertainty or resistance reflects both the uncertainty and resistance in within the patient population, but also within the clinical population as well. All right, so let's start with number one, rationale. So, you know, honestly, I used to have to try and make all these arguments for um, behavioral health clinicians to be uh, more sort of in-depthly interested in this topic. But back in October, I think it was, the New England Gen New England Journal of Medicine published this perspective. Um, this was um, co-authored by a number of members of various federal agencies like the NIH, the CDC, the FDA, et cetera, and they basically made the argument for me. They said that uh, we really have to refocus our efforts on America's longest running pandemic. Um, we have to actually not lose track of the fact that smoking kills a lot of folks and that the majority of those folks actually turn out to be uh, those among us who are affected by serious mental illness and addiction. And so they came up with a lot of ways that they're going to look for policy changes that affect both clinicians, but also health systems, individual hospitals, and behavioral health treatment facilities that might uh, amplify our effectiveness managing this problem. And so for those of you who have an interest in uh, drug and alcohol dependence, you actually recognize that the prevalence of tobacco use in that population of patients is quite high down here at the bottom of the slide. You'll notice that um, for both the years uh, 2015 and 2016, prevalence was in the 77% range for cigarettes, approximately 16% range for e-cigarettes, and about 5 to 8% for other uh, tobacco products. Th those uh, numbers don't add up to 100%, of course, because lots of folks use more than one product, but the majority of, of tobacco use is in the form of cigarettes within that community. And it's actually, that's not an accident. It turns out that um, if you are addicted to nicotine, if you are a smoker, that your odds of becoming addicted to cocaine are seven times the odds of the non-smoking population. A similar effect is true for heroin. If you're a smoker, you, you suffer 16 times the rate or 16 times the likelihood of becoming addicted to heroin, 14 times the likelihood of becoming addicted to crack, and seven times the likelihood of becoming addicted to marijuana. So there is some physical overlap between these substances. Um, th the overlap is being elucidated more uh, in depth every day. It's at the cellular level. It turns out that a lot of these chemicals share uh, the induction of a particular chemical inside the cell that actually increases the risk of, of response to the other chemical. So even though they uh, function on different receptor systems, uh, behind the receptors, there's a sort of root cause uh, of addiction that um, transcends the various categories of drug. And the effect of that is actually visible in terms of treatment. In the old days, we used to imagine that you, you, you dealt with one problem at a time. You needed to manage the alcohol. You needed to manage the heroin because that's what was going to get folks into trouble. And you just sort of let them keep smoking because you can't take everything away from them. Those sorts of ideas have uh, gone out of favor because, um, because of the um, the shared underlying physiology, if you treat all the substances of dependence, you actually improve the relative rate of abstinence by a relative 25%. So folks who get treated for tobacco dependence while they're trying to recover from alcohol dependence actually do a better job of achieving and sustaining their abstinence from their primary drug of concern. And here's data on relapse. This is long-term relapse. Now check out these graphs. This is nine years of follow-up in about a thousand subjects that are in recovery. For those folks who are able to stop smoking while in recovery, they're able to maintain approximately 50% uh, um, um, stay, remain in recovery without relapse. Whereas folks who actually continue to smoking um, actually only 40% of that group are actually able to maintain uh, recovery without relapse for that long term. That relative difference of 13% doesn't sound like a big change, but that's nine years and that's a cumulative thing. So 
that small difference actually has a large population, potential population effect. Now, the other thing that folks really worry about is whether or not trying to deal with smoking is going to actually chase folks out of substance abuse treatment, uh, keep them out of recovery, et cetera. We don't see that uh, data inside of Philadelphia. A couple of years ago, Philadelphia went smoke-free in all their substance use and behavioral health uh, facilities. Um, we don't see an increase in uh, leaving against medical advice. We don't see an increase in seclusion or restraint use. Uh, we don't see an increase in use of sedation or any kind of indicator that suggests that there's a ruckus that is caused by reducing or limiting access to tobacco. Um, the one thing that we also don't see is a real change in how much nicotine replacement is used. So we're forcing people into an abstinence position, but really are still only using nicotine replacement therapy about four and a half percent of the time. So this is one of the things that we really sort of uh, need to change um, institutionally within behavioral health is a, is a willingness or freedom to use some of these medications a little bit more frequently. We'll talk about that in the next section. Now, if behavioral health, like serious mental illness, is what you're really interested in, you also know that the prevalence of tobacco use in this subgroup of patients is actually also quite high. And the more severe the thought disorder is, the more likely they are to actually end up uh, also using tobacco. Not only do they use tobacco more frequently, they use a lot more of it. Um, the serious mental illness population makes up a little less than 20% of the overall general population, but uses more than 40% of all the tobacco. And even though they're using more tobacco, they're also per unit of consumption, per cigarette, they're using they're smoking more aggressively. They're taking deeper breaths, delivering more deeply into the lungs, and having a much larger overall total smoke exposure. Result of that is that these folks actually uh, experience about a 20% shorter lifespan. Um, they, they live four-fifths of a life, and which is really unfortunate. And the, the risk of dying is actually highest for smoking-related diseases. Uh, uh, Cardiovascular disease, there's a two and a half fold increase in likelihood of that. Respiratory cancers, upper aerodigestive cancers make, make up about a three fold increase in risk. And respiratory diseases like uh, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, et cetera, a little over three fold increase in risk in this population. Now, what's interesting about um, helping people to stop smoking in this in this population, in the serious mental illness population, is that because of the place in the brain where nicotine does its work, there is some degree of overlap with impulse control, with emotional uh, lability and emotion control, et cetera. So it turns out that if all you did to folks with anxiety or depression, for example, was help them to stop smoking, you get about the same relative impact on their anxiety and or depression scores as you would by prescribing one anti-anxiety or one antidepressant medication. So, you know, it's just a rough estimate, but the, the point is that you're actually helping them to remove the effects of nicotine from the system actually is helpful in helping them to manage their mood disorder. Same thing is true for stress, uh, measures of stress in their daily life. We tend to think about smoking as a means of managing or decreasing stress. It turns out in the overall, in the long run, by taking nicotine out of the system, stress scores go down. Um, uh, quality of life, from a, the psychological quality of life, um, how good they feel, what, how optimistic they are, what their outlook is on life, that improves uh, a substantial amount. Uh, so just by helping them take the smoking out of the equation, you actually act, can influence the degree, uh, the severity of their mental illness um, at baseline. Now, understanding that effect has to do with understanding where in the brain nicotine is doing its job. And I put this fancy diagram up, but you don't have to really remember the actual locations. Just remember that it's really about um, a bunch of different locations in the brain 
in the early evolutionary structures of the brain, the part of the brain that's really responsible for keeping us out of trouble, survival instincts. This is, um, these are the structures that make up something called the mesolimbic system in the brain. Um, and the relationships between this, these structures are amenable to change in strength based on what's going on in the outside world. So what do I mean by that? If the mesolimbic system is confronted with a barking dog or growling dog or something like that, the brain wants to be able to prepare itself for barking dog the next time. So the strength of relationships and the, the potential for the mesolimbic system to instinctively keep us away from barking dogs is augmented based on prior experience. Well, it turns out that all of these spots in the mesolimbic system have um, uh, neurotransmitter receptor systems that can be fooled by nicotine. What do I mean by that? It turns out that there are no such thing as nicotine receptors in the body. There are other receptors, in this case for acetylcholine, that are close enough in structure where they can be, that nicotine can act as an imposter uh, neurotransmitter signal chemical. So when nicotine actually hits the mesolimbic system, what it's really doing, is, instead of sedating us or making our problems go away, what it's really doing is creating a safety signal inside the survival instinct part of the brain that makes us feel gratified, correct, whole, safe and secure, basically. And that's really what um, is happening when people smoke. And so overall, the problem of nicotine addiction is really not one of creating robots that have lost the ability to make decisions for themselves. It's really about balance. You start off with a balance between the survival instinct parts of the brain and the parts of the brain that are responsible for cognitive control. And then by adding nicotine to the system, you change the relationship between those areas of the brain such that the balance is now out of whack um, and survival instincts are, are driving behavioral decisions more than cognitive control mechanisms can actually slow them down. So I like to think of these as the sort of baseline no-go condition, whereas over time, after exposure to nicotine, you end up with what we think of as a compulsive go condition in response to environmental triggers. So I think I'm, I'll pause there before we move on to talk a little bit about the guideline and actually take a look and see uh, whether we have some comments in the chat or questions that we might be able to deal with. Great, yes, uh, audience, we would love to hear your comments uh, for Dr. Leone, please, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Yeah, I think uh, I will start with some comments. I think this is from both Catherine and I. So are there any uh, interactions between the NRT and um, the population who have mental health issues? So in other words, uh, there could be problems with adherence in our, um, NRTs uh, among this population. So can you comment on that and how this, uh, what the implications uh, that this may have? So that's my first comment. Yeah, so that's actually a really great question. And I'll show you some data if we get far enough into the slides that, um, that gives you the actual uh, sort of actual scientific explanation for this. But the basic message is that this is a group of people that have a lot of stuff going on. So the absolute numbers of people who will respond to the medications is in fact a little bit lower than a group of non-SMI um, patients. However, having said that, the relative impact of the pharmacotherapeutic interventions of behavioral interventions on this group is actually the same. The pattern of relative effectiveness is actually the same. There aren't a whole lot of concerns over ill effects of these medications in this group of patients. Um, the biggest ill effect is that when we don't use it and we, we don't we simply rely on our counseling strategies. We're really not giving this group of patients access to the most effective treatments, and we are, in effect, creating an intrinsic disparity that's probably uh, unfair. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and we have a question from the audience. Um, does the form of nicotine intake matter? For example, snooze pouch versus combustible cigarettes. Um, can you answer to that? Yeah, so um, the impact of nicotine on that mesolimbic system depends an awful lot, like incredibly a lot, on the kinetics of delivery of nicotine to the brain. So the device that is trying to deliver nicotine to the person uh, matters an awful lot. Um, the analogy is the difference between salt cocaine that you put in your nose and crack cocaine that you smoke and you, and you put in your lungs. About 35% of the nicotine that comes out of cigarettes is in the free base form, which means that you can turn it into a gas and you can deliver it to the lungs. In the free base form, it binds with the water that's in the airway and is absorbed very, very rapidly into the blood and is delivered about 10 times more rapidly to the brain than other forms of nicotine. Um, so the device actually matters quite a bit, This is, which is why you don't see a lot of people sort of becoming addicted to the patch. Nobody goes out for nicotine gum breaks at work. Um, you know, it's just not the same. It's the same chemical, but a slightly different form makes it the impact very, very different. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Mike. So imagine a state Medicaid program has limited resources. Does offering psychotropic um, medications have the biggest bang for buck in terms of reducing smoking or smoking cessation medications? Yeah, so in terms of bang for buck, it turns out that varenicline is going to have the highest return for per dollar. Um, it's the most expensive, but it's a lot more effective. And so on a population level, um, using or, or sort of favoring the use of varenicline actually makes the most pharmacoeconomic sense. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of data on the relative impact of varenicline compared to some of the other medications. Um, but having said that, even, even within a system where there are restrictions on use or some kind of um, you know, administrative obstacles like you have to fail nicotine first, et cetera. The, the idea of to dealing with tobacco dependence is actually in and of itself exceedingly, extremely um, cost-effective in the order of about $1,500 per quality adjusted life year saved, which is like uh, you know, pennies on the dollar. Uh, okay, I think we have time for uh, one last question and then we can continue. Uh, so this is from Catherine. Does nicotine biodynamics differ across those ways, SMI and not SMI? That is how quickly nicotine gets to the brain. Does that differ across products which have different biodynamic patterns? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. So in terms of delivery to the brain, it really only depends on what the proportion of free base nicotine is in the delivery system. So for example, um, the for some of you are familiar with the Juul uh, electronic cigarette pod system. That particular brand, that particular device is actually very effective at delivering free base nicotine because of the chemistry involved. Whereas other pod systems may not have the same uh, degree of free base nicotine content involved. And so delivery to the brain may be, um, may be different. Um, a lot of the sort of uh, dynamics of the medication, the pharmacodynamics dependent on the person's ability to metabolize the nicotine. So how quickly the nicotine is actually metabolized once it's delivered to the system. Um, and that does have a, a very big impact on people's response to some of these pharmacotherapeutic interventions. Shall we move on, see? Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So in section two, we're going to talk a little bit about the pharmacologic treatment guideline and see um, what we can derive from there. Well, it turns out that about 10 years ago or so, we started getting curious about why with all these wonderful guidelines and all this great evidence that's available, why is it that clinicians aren't really doing more 
around uh, treating tobacco dependence. You know, I, I was sort of sick and tired of, of doing a talk and hearing doctors say, if we only do one thing to help them live longer, be to help them stop smoking and be like, okay, well then why don't you do that one thing? And so we started trying to figure out how to evaluate that question a little bit more deeply. And the first thing we did was a discrete choice analysis. So for those in the audience, you guys are mostly all familiar with the notion of going to the uh, optometrist and you sit behind the, the, the thing and the person goes, is it one or is it two? Is it two or is it three? Is it three or is it one? And they go back and forth and they ask you a discrete pick one, which is your preferred idea, which is your preferred output uh, with the lenses. And so we did the same thing. We kind of came up with a couple of dozen hypothetical smoking cessation interventions. And we just rated them based on efficacy, their level of reimbursement to the clinicians, and how much time it took for the clinician to implement those hypothetical, pretend, completely theoretical uh, interventions. And we just asked them, so given these two interventions, which one would you pick? Okay, given these two interventions, which one would you pick? Okay, given these two interventions, which one would you pick? And by doing that over and over again, you get a sense of not only which of these three parameters is really affecting choice, but by how much. And it turned out that perceived efficacy of the intervention really had a very strong signal for influencing their choice in this model whereas level of reimbursement and how much time it took them to implement really didn't change, had no impact on their uh, choice at all. So we thought, okay, so it really all comes down to efficacy. So even though in the literature, people are talking about, you know, it takes me too long, I don't get paid for this, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. It's really about the perceived efficacy of the intervention. So we then said, well, what do we need to do in order to figure out how clinicians perceive efficacy of tobacco dependence interventions. And it turns out we identified uh, four what we think of as cardinal biases. These are mental shortcuts that are intrinsic to all of us, but that have a particular influence uh, on clinicians when they're making decisions about tobacco dependence treatment. We, we identified availability bias, meaning that a clinician's um, sort of dramatic experience, uh, for example, a patient who just had a heart attack, but who sneaks out of the hospital to smoke a cigarette. That's a dramatic experience. That experience is very available in that person's mind and can influence decision-making in a profound way. Focusing effect bias, an example of that might be, um, you come to me, you're short of breath, you smoke, but I gotta deal with the underlying, what I can deal with to help you not be short of breath. The idea of dealing with the smoking next is feels more correct even though if i let you keep smoking you're going to you're you're more likely to continue to be short of breath impact bias what kind of what's this going to do my ability to to handle this uh, interaction with you in a timely fashion or omission bias if i'm a little bit nervous about these medications and what the potential side effect profile is i'd rather just not deal with it right now in favor of, uh, even though not dealing with it, puts the patients at greater risk in the long run. So we identified these biases and then we said, what happens if we teach on these biases instead of teaching the standard approach like, you know, this is a patch, this is how you use it, smoking is bad, et cetera. But we taught about these biases instead. And this, is a, this, this slide's a little bit difficult to understand, but I'm just gonna point you in the direction of, this. What we did was we asked a hundred uh, or so family practice uh, primary care clinicians across the country to bet money. We gave them, uh, we pretended to give them a hundred dollars to bet and we said distribute that hundred dollars according to maximizing your return um, on how effective your intervention is likely to be. How, what's the probability of being able to affect your patient's problem if the problem is hypertension, diabetes, or tobacco. And so this P of tobacco per DM, this is uh, the, what they, the sort of how much money they actually bet on it. They said, look, the probability of being able to affect tobacco compared to my ability affecting diabetes is actually pretty low, uh, you know, whatever. 
we taught on these biases about the efficacy, and then uh, about 60 days later, went back and actually measured their probability of tobacco versus diabetes again, and uh, increased it by about 100%. Um, so there's, there's definitely some influence of these biases that's impacting decision making that's more complicated than just whether or not they recognize uh, you know, a patch, or what the appropriate dose is, the sort of content areas of, of, of pharmacology. Our next step was to actually think a little bit about what the emotional impact was of taking care of various chronic illnesses. And a lot of folks talk about, um, you know, whether it's important to the patients or not, whether they want help or not, whether they'll follow up or not. And we wanted to understand whether that was part and parcel of dealing with any chronic illness or whether there was something special about tobacco. So we asked us a, a different sample of primary care clinicians across the country, um, a, a variety of questions that were uh, framed in such a way where there's the question and then sort of it was either about hypertension or tobacco and the computer presented those questions in random order. So they weren't you know, right up against each other and, and clinicians had a less li likelihood of kind of referencing the questions to each other. It turns out that all of their answers were essentially the same. Uh, single word answers about utility to the patient, the technical or professional requirements, whether or not what the character of the patients were, were all basically exactly the same. There was one area where things stood out as very, very different there was the statistical difference in how often clinicians caring for tobacco um, reported some emotional construct related to frustration. And frustration is actually very important as a concept because frustration tends to uh, signal that there's a essentially a character flaw aspect of the problem. The problem is more likely to be considered a sin rather than a sickness. And in the face of it being a sin, frustration is the natural outcome of that. And so what we did was we uh, developed an implicit um, association test that tried to measure how likely clinicians were to associate concept of uh, guilt versus innocence with smoking status, like with the person who's a smoker. And what the machine did was present them first with a bunch of words that were synonyms for innocent versus guilty, words like blameless, honest, or liable, hurtful, et cetera. And they had to sort those words to various sides of the screen. And then the computer presented them with pictures of people who were either smokers or not smokers, right? We don't know anything about this person as to whether or not he's a smoker or not, but if the picture showed them smoking, they put them on this side, and the picture showed them not smoking, they put them on that side. Um, they were actually quite able to sort pictures of people who were smoking uh, on the same side as guilty. But when we asked them to sort pictures of people who were smoking on the same side as the word innocent, it took them almost twice as long, which as far as implicit bias testing is like an astronomical difference and how long it takes to sort. And so we identified what we believe to be what we call a culpability bias, whereas even though clinicians may not be necessarily aware of it, that they've been taught that smoking is a function of addiction, nicotine is addictive, et cetera, that they still feel that it's kind of the smoker's fault for uh, smoking. Even if they're not willing to say that out loud, that association feels most comfortable on the inside and may be influencing the decision to treat. So the next, the final step was to really reframe a lot of the data around tobacco use treatment into a clinical guideline that could offer a very simple, uh, more or less universal clinical path that reduced choice paralysis on the part of the clinicians, emphasized effectiveness, and minimized perceived impact on workflow. And so for those of you who have any um, background in evidence-based medicine, you know that what you do first is you identify what the clinical questions are that you want to ask. And so we wanted to know 
what was the best initial medication choice? We wanted to know after we get a sense of what the best initial medication choice is, are there ways to modify that choice to, to sort of boost its effectiveness? What about important patient level moderators? What if the patient's not interested in pharmacotherapy? What if um, they have mental health or substance use disorder? Or what if they're not interested in quitting at all? And then finally, how long should I be treating? If I do start treatment, how long is best to continue? And by developing those clinical questions, you can format them in a way that allows you to analyze the evidence uh, for them. And so uh, we did this process, which uses um, a method called the grade evidence to decision approach. It really tries to weigh the um, evidence in favor of benefits of the intervention against the harms of the intervention, but also integrates things like patient values, feasibility, uh, any information about cost or impact on equity. And so um, the first set of questions really established varenicline as the most effective or optimal controller. That wasn't really a surprise. What was a surprise was the first analysis of looking at varenicline plus patch versus varenicline alone. And it turns out that actually combining these medications has a pretty significant impact on a person's ability to put cigarettes down. We had three randomized clinical trials that gave us data on about 800 patients. And the relative uh, risk of being able to put the cigarettes down was 36% higher uh, with the combination approach than it was with the single monotherapy approach. If you take that number and you sort of do the math, you imagine that you've treated a thousand patients in your practice, by using combination approach, you can anticipate getting about 105 additional patients uh, to help them stop smoking. <clears throat> in a similar way, we looked at whether or not we should be using varenicline or the patch in behavioral health patients. We had two randomized clinical trials, gave us data on 2,200 subjects. Um, the relative risk or relative impact was 31% higher in patients who got varenicline compared to the nicotine patch, 78% uh, higher at end of treatment. Um, if you do the math, we anticipate 36 additional patients per thousand treatment. Um, and so we made a strong recommendation favoring varenicline over patch. And here's the data that we talked a little bit about earlier in terms of side effects and patterns of use. This is uh, the, a key clinical trial that was published, I think, in 2016. Um, and what it did was they, they recruited 8,000 subjects uh, across five or six countries and followed them for five years. And of those 8,000 folks, 4,000 had serious mental illness. The other 4,000 were matched in terms of age, sex, uh, comorbid conditions, except that they didn't have uh, serious mental illness. And you'll notice, again, with not a big surprise, varenicline turned out to be the, the peach is the varenicline here, blue bupropion, green nicotine patch, et cetera. So uh, varenicline turned out to be the most effective patch and bupropion, second most effective compared to counseling alone, which was really least effective. This is on the short term, three months. This is on the long term, six months outcomes. And you'll notice that the relative pattern of impact is actually exactly the same whether it was tested in the 4,000 patients uh, with serious mental illness compared to the 4,000 patients without. Now the absolute value may be a little bit lower, for each of these, but the pattern, the relative effectiveness is really what's important in this population. In terms of adverse events, um, the overall adverse event rate was in the 4% range. For the non-psychiatric cohort, it was about 2%. In the psychiatric cohort, it was right about 5.5% or 6%. The important point here is that number one, 5.5% or 6% adverse event rates for a pharmacotherapeutic trial are pretty standard, not very different from other medications that we use on a daily basis. And the second point is that it was not about which medication you chose. Uh, it was not even about whether you gave a medication versus counseling. It's really about having a brain that's been exposed to nicotine 
um, <clears throat> in the long term and whether or not that exposure to nicotine creates adverse events. Everybody's always really been worried about the potential for suicide among people who use varenicline. In that particular EAGLES trial, there was one suicide over that five-year evaluation period, and it happened in a patient in the non-psychiatric cohort receiving counseling alone. That's the only suicide that happened. That was approximately equivalent to the background suicide rate in the general population. Um, so we don't really think about varenicline as causing, or any of these, as causing any significant kinds of side effects, and we certainly don't think of it as a uh, suicide risk. Now, the last thing that was actually pretty interesting was, um, you know, everybody on this webinar has heard at some point in the past that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You got to be, you got to let people be ready to quit before they quit. And we thought that that might be wrong. Actually, we thought that a person's readiness to quit may be an outcome of treatment rather than the prerequisite of treatment. So we flipped that question on its head and we said, what if you pre-treat patients who don't have no intention of quitting? What happens to their likelihood of going on to achieve abstinence? We had four randomized clinical trials which gave us data on about uh, 1,300 subjects. And it turns out that there's a huge increase in the likelihood that people will go on to quit if you don't sit around and wait for them to get ready, right? So it's not, we're not talking about giving people medication who don't consent to the medication. These are all people who said, yeah, I'm willing to try the medicine as long as you don't force me to quit smoking. We separated those two ideas. They were ready to take medication, but not ready to put the cigarettes down. And so by doing that, we anticipate about 300, 300 additional people putting their cigarettes down per thousand treated. That's a huge pharmacologic effect. That is huge. And that's a very simple structural change in just our perspective on what it means to be uh, effective. And here's some of the data behind that recommendation. This was uh, the first randomized trial, it was about 1,500 subjects who were recruited specifically because they were not interested in quitting. These are specifically not interested in quitting. And they got started either on varenicline or on placebo and then followed four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks out. Four months later, and the varenicline arm is still accumulating people who were not ready to quit smoking at inception, but who eventually changed their mind. And look at that, they achieved 40% of folks who didn't want to quit to start with were actually able to achieve abstinence at some point in the study by simply treating them with the medication and not forcing them to stop as a result. So I think I'll pause here and see if there are questions we might want to answer at this point um, that has to do with some specifics around pharmacotherapy. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Leone. We have just a couple of questions in the Q&A, and please, uh, members of the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A. Uh, we just had one question going back uh, with Jewel. Uh, th there was a comment that um, Jewel uses nicotine salts, uh, not free base like other e-cigarette liquids. I'm wondering if that has any um, implications for some of your thoughts around that product. Yeah, actually that is um, sort of the marketing position that they use nicotine salts. Well, the, well, what they're really doing, what they're not saying is that they use a specific nicotine salt. They use the dominant nicotine salt in Juul in particular is nicotine benzoate. And that's actually really important. That, that particular salt of nicotine doesn't exist in the plant in very high proportions. So they, they uh, sort of take the nicotine from the plant, process it so that the major, the major salt of nicotine is nicotine benzoate, and that's what they use in their solution. So from that perspective, the comment is correct that it is a very special salt of nicotine that is being used in the jewel. What makes nicotine benzoate so, um, special is that at sort of lower temperatures and normal pH in the back of the airway, 
that nicotine benzoate, that salt, will dissociate temporarily. It's very fast. It's not like the kind of it's not like the free base form sits around very long. But the benzoate pops off and allows a proton, a, a hydrogen atom, to be attached to the nicotine molecule itself. And it's protonated nicotine, right? Nicotine with a hydrogen atom on it that actually has transport proteins that allow it to move both from the uh, alveolar, uh, from the lung airspace into the bloodstream, but then also from the bloodstream across what's called the blood-brain barrier and into the brain. So um, it's really the details around using salts, fewer, less free base, et cetera, that actually make uh, the difference between the sort of um, chemist position or perspective on this issue and the marketing position on the issue. I hope that actually answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, a qu another question just about some of the work that you have presented. Um, in some of your um, studies that look at physician uh, treatment of tobacco, uh, tobacco dependence, did you consider the idea of reimbursement bias for busy private practice physicians? So I believe that means perhaps a differential um, reimbursement across services. Yeah, that's actually a really good question, and we didn't. Um, and so, you know, we just sort of put all reimbursement concerns into a big bucket. But there's, you know, there's lots of different possibilities. It may be that reimbursement concerns affect different types of clinicians differently. It might be there, there are reasons why it might, there might be geographic influences on it. Um, a reimbursement bias that doesn't exist at the sort of $10 reimbursement level might be really important at the $100 reimbursement level. Um, we, didn't, we didn't investigate any of that stuff, but that's really a really important question, sure. A future, a future study. Uh, just one or two more questions, then we'll, we'll get back to your talk. Um, do you have any thoughts about how one might address misperceptions held by patients and physicians uh, regarding relative risks across um, nicotine products. So I guess that's an idea that perhaps um, some products may be less risky than other products. Yeah, so um, this is really a, um, it's sort of a, it's a question that actually assumes that we have adequate risk information across all those products. So we have we have lots of risk information about cigarettes, cigars, tobacco, uh, you know, pipe. We have lots of risk information about patch and gum. If I'm correct, what I'm imagining the, the, the questioner is really asking is whether or not electronic cigarettes represent a, a valuable method for reducing the potential harm of cigarettes. If that's the case, the problem is, is that the denominator is, remains really unknown. There's a lot of inferential information out there that suggests that maybe some harms may be reduced. For example, there are far fewer uh, cancer-causing chemicals in electronic cigarette aerosol than there are in uh, tobacco smoke. But, there's also a lot of inferential data out there that suggests that electronic cigarettes may have a risk profile that's different than uh, tobacco smoke. So uh, the ability to cause or to sort of light up or, uh, or magnify, amplify inflammatory pathways that aren't really involved with tobacco smoke. That's a problem for us, whereas we don't really have solid information on overall risk of the whole palette of tobacco products. So coming to conclusion uh, is premature. Thank you very much. I'll just have one more question before we get back to your talk. Um, I think there's a question about uh, with physicians, is there a possibility that perhaps um, interest in treating different um, conditions, for example, smoking versus something like um, a diabetes, perhaps the physician has um, a specific interest in diabetes versus smoking, and that may lead to uh, focusing on, for example, the diabetes 
rather than um, smoking during a healthcare professional visit? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And we do have at least, a, a, we're starting, and it'll be a couple of years before I can report it to you with certainty, but we're starting to actually um, kind of ping on that. And that's, in other words, um, I can remember being a pulmonary fellow and thinking to myself, you know, if doctors just had a blood test, some kind of numerical value that would make it all like sciency and stuff, that they would resonate with that a little bit more. And I think that's kind of the model that your questioner has really got in mind. Is it, is it, is what we do for tobacco dependence consistent with the model of medicine? Um, I think, uh, I think there's something to that. And I think that in the past, the perspective that has framed sort of quote smoking cessation as being a different set of skills, a different set of counseling strategies, a whole new set of pharmacotherapy that only the experts know about. By creating it as different, by framing it as different from day-to-day -day activities, we may have had a pretty significant unintended consequence on the likelihood that clinicians will engage. Um, so we're starting to really get into that, but I don't really have an answer just yet. I'm hoping to have more of an answer in a couple of years when you invite me back. I was just going to say, Dr. Leone, we will have to have you back in a couple of years to hear more about this work. Um, there, I think what we'll have to do is return to your talk. We have about 10 minutes left. Sure. I just want to be mindful of your time, but uh, this is really fascinating, so thank you. Oh, cool. Great. I'm glad that you guys are enjoying it. All right, so let's see. So we want to try and develop a framework for dealing with uh, uncertainty and resistance. This is really the foundation of the kind of blood testy, uh, sciency idea that we've been talking about. Um, you can ignore all the rest of the stuff on this slide. This is really just meant to impress you with how much chemistry goes into sort of metabolizing nicotine. This is really what's inside the red circle here that's uh, most important about nicotine metabolism. Nicotine for the most part is metabolized first into cotinine and then cotinine gets metabolized into something called trans or 3-hydroxycotinine. Uh, and the transition from nicotine to cotinine and then cotinine to 3-hydroxycotinine uh, are related to how active this particular enzyme is. And the short, I don't know why biologists name enzymes this way, but they do. And uh, so this one, CYP2A6, actually is responsible for this part of the pathway. Now, CYP2A6 activity is modified a lot by um, environmental things. Um, what other medications you might be on. Uh, if you're uh, a woman, there's actually a, sort of a monthly variation in how active this particular enzyme is. But because both of these transitions are influenced by that same variability in CYP2A6 activity, it really turns out to be that the ratio between 3-hydroxycotinine and cotinine is a reasonable blood test, a reasonable way to kind of calculate whether you're a fast metabolizer of nicotine or a slow metabolizer of nicotine. And it turns out that you're sort of metabolic status has a pretty profound impact on your response to medication. This is one of the earliest studies that was done to look at exactly this idea. Um, I'm going to just call your attention down here in the lower right-hand corner. Um, first of all, the first thing to notice is that these bars are split up into quartile of metabolic activity. The first quartile are the slowest metabolizers, the fourth quartiles are the fastest metabolizers. And if you gave a patch to a slow metabolizer, the patch worked great. Almost half the time the patch, patch users were able to achieve abstinence. But if you were a fast metabolizer, the patch was about half as effective. Now that difference was not seen when you gave people the spray, the nicotine nasal spray. Why? Because the nicotine nasal spray is designed to be used as needed, ad lib. And so regardless of what your metabolic status was, you could up or down sort of titrate how much nicotine you were getting, and the nicotine nasal spray was able to actually achieve absence about 25 or 30% of the time. So the bottom line is the 
metabolic status had a pretty significant influence on which of the medications was likely to be effective and how effective we thought it should be. And that, that and data a lot like that were the um, justification for this randomized clinical trial. About 1,200 people randomized to two cohorts. We identified people a priori up front. We identified them as either slow metabolizers or fast metabolizers, and then randomized them to receive placebo patch or varenicline. And it turned out what what you would expect might actually be the case turned out to be the case. First, look at the red bars up here, upper left-hand corner of this graph, the red bars. These are folks who got the nicotine patch. If they were slow metabolizers, the nicotine patch worked better than if they were fast metabolizers. But also now take a look at varenicline. Varenicline worked way better in fast metabolizers than it did in slow metabolizers. And the opposite is true for adverse um, adverse event rates. So if you were a slow metabolizer, your adverse event rate for, for varenicline was higher than it was for nicotine. That's not true if you were a fast metabolizer. So um, we're in the middle of a study right now where what we're doing is identifying patients who are about to go see their primary care clinician, right? We know who's got an appointment coming up in primary care practice. And we look to see what their smoking status is and then recruit them to come in, take a little history, get their consent to get a blood test. And then uh, from there, the, the physicians, the clinicians in, these, in this cohort study either receive an alert that gives them the nicotine metabolic status or they don't. So here's just a, an example. Um, <clears throat> um, this is just a sort of plain old hey, your patient's a smoker, you wanna open the smart set uh, to, to help you manage your tobacco use uh, treatment, or they get the sort of augmented uh, alert that says, hey, there's a pharmacogenetic interaction, your patient has been identified as a fast metabolizer, and based on the nicotine metabolite ratio, we might expect an improved therapeutic response with varenicline of course, the opposite is true if they're slow metabolizers. We just tell them which is the preferred medication based on effectiveness and side effect. And then we ask them, do you want to order it or don't you? And we're looking to see what the relative impact is of giving uh, clinicians that sort of um, fun factor that you guys talked about before, uh, a blood test that actually makes a big difference. Um, I think I'm just going to stop there in the interest of time. Um, and see if there's a couple of questions towards the end. Um, the, we have another study that's looking specifically at integrating some of these strategies within the behavioral health. Uh, we're coming to the end of a five-year study. We have 14 sites randomized, and we're trying to figure out, the, the initial impression is that um, it's well accepted, and uh, um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. It's, it's well accepted intervention, and a relatively readily integrated uh, if presented in the right fashion. So I'll stop there and see if there are comments or questions in the chat. This is really fantastic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Leone. Uh, do we have um, any questions from uh, the Q&A? Um, if not, maybe see if you have a moment or a question or two, please let us go, let us go. Let yeah, us know. I only have one last comment regarding uh, the studies that you conducted in choice experiments in now physicians and clinicians. Uh, I'm aware of some studies that are trying to also incorporate patient preference and caregiver preference, like patients themselves and also their caregivers. So I'm wondering if this is a, a sensible way of addressing um, NRT treatments among as, uh, those with mental illness. Because I feel, you know, caregivers may be also an important population to uh, investigate in this case and wow. how they view the treatments. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as a matter of kind of practicality, um, I focus an awful lot on pharmacotherapeutic interventions. Our research is really is mostly around randomized clinical trials trying to identify pharmacotherapeutic strategies. But as a clinician, my practice is really mostly 
around behavioral interventions, really trying to understand what the environmental, social, uh, learned patterns are and using an understanding of human nature to really try and, I don't know, un unpeel that onion or something, whatever the right metaphor might be, um, really kind of roll back the clock uh, on the impact of nicotine. Now, we do use a lot of pharmacotherapy as for supports in, in various circumstances, but the main thrust is always trying to figure out what is the best intervention for this patient in this circumstance. And that, that frequently means there's an awful lot of work up front even before you start uh, pharmacotherapy. And I can imagine that uh, patients with serious mental illness have a lot of modifying variables that might make you define success very differently for that group, at least initially anyway, might make you define success very differently for that group than you would for a different group. Uh, you know, uh, patients post heart attack, I might, I might think about those people as needing, as, as my desire might be to get them to put the cigarettes down within 30 days. But for patients with, uh, particularly patients with serious mental illness, we might actually deal an awful lot with learning, um, learning to really identify what the patterns are. Um, they're not necessarily always super obvious. Or working on, say, for example, group group residential facilities, we might need to actually work an awful lot on what the group norms are first for a couple of months before we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to put that kind of work into a grand round style talk, which is why it never really shows up well. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thank you to the audience of 90 people uh, for participation. Our next seminar speaker will be Dr. Michael Darden giving a presentation on February 4th titled Cities and Smoking. After leaving the seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top-notch weekend. Thank you all. all right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it all. See ya.